Hey, Book Talk. There's some stuff happening over on Book Twitter that I don't think enough of us over here are talking about yet. So there was talk on Twitter about biphobia and bi erasure, transphobia, and Becky Albertalli's name was coming up. You do not have to be um, in a certain relationship to be considered bisexual, even if you are in a relationship with someone of a different gender that doesn't make you any less bisexual. Let me be perfectly clear. This isn't how I wanted to come out. This doesn't feel good or empowering or even particularly safe. Honestly, I'm doing this because I've been scrutinized, subtweeted, mocked, lectured, and invalidated just about every single day for years, and I'm exhausted. About a week ago, a burner account appeared on Twitter, zero followers, zero following. They just post a lot of really vile, transphobic, and biphobic things. The people on Twitter connecting it to actually an author with an upcoming debut in 2022. It has been almost one year. August 31st, 2020, about a year ago from the time that I'm filming this, was the date that a beloved young adult author was pressured to come out of the closet as part of the LGBT community before she was ready to. But what's different about this situation is that this author's forced coming out story wasn't the result of homophobic a-holes or some bigoted person trying to blackmail her. However, this author still felt forced to come out of the closet for the sake of saving her own career. And what was really weird about this situation was the crowd that put this pressure on her was doing it completely unknowingly and was actually trying to act with good intentions. In fact, a lot of the pressure that she felt came from within the LGBT community itself. And after she finally came out, an entire discussion erupted within the book community about what it meant to have good representation of a marginalized group in literature. It threw the entire own voices movement, which had been taking over the literary world for the past couple of years, into complete question. Today we're going to talk about the story of Becky Albertalli. And when this story happened, when this entire situation happened about a year ago and everything unfolded thereafter, this story hit me hard because I realized that I'm terrified that something similar to this could one day happen to me. Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should take up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. What's up my fellow small business supporters, I'm Savvy and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome for the first time, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button because every Monday and Friday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern time, we talk on this channel about books and business. We often also incorporate commentary about the LGBT community as well. For those of you who don't know me, I am an author and a small business owner in Chicago. Much like Becky Albertalli, I am a young adult LGBT author. My newest novel, 90s Kids, came out this past June. You can check it out linked in the description below. It is a female, female, own voices, bisexual, time travel novel. It's lesbian back to the future. Let's just call it what it is. It's lesbian back to the future. Check it out linked below. Also, please don't forget to check out my second channel, which is called Your Morning Guru, where every morning at 8 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Eastern, my friend and I stream living the lives of various business gurus. We've been having a lot of fun. This week we're studying atheism, which is really interesting. So if you want a show that breaks down echo chambers and pursues curiosity of all types of ways of living, then definitely check out Your Morning Guru. The internet can really be scary sometimes. And that's why today I'm really grateful that I have a sponsor for this video, which is a VPN company, which cares about the concept of online protection. Today's video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. If you guys remember a couple months ago, Atlas VPN sponsored another one of my videos and the deal that I talked about in that video is actually still going on. So I wanted to let you guys know about that. Currently Atlas VPN is running a huge discount for their three year deal of just $1.39 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee. You can check out that deal linked in the description below. If you guys don't know how a VPN works, basically a VPN is a way to protect yourself and your data online. Atlas VPN is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location. By inserting your email address, the tool scans the internet to see if you ended up in any recorded data breaches or data dumps that include emails, names, passwords, or other sensitive information. If you enable notifications, that 
that ensures that you are aware of such incidents and gives you a heads up so that you can change your password right away before anyone with malicious intent has a chance to access any of your accounts. Like I said, the internet can be a scary place and I think something that a lot of us are worried about, or if we're not, we probably should be worried about, is safety and privacy when we're online. Here's an example. Sometimes an advanced doxer might use a URL shortener that replaces a space in a URL that you have and just by making that small change it ends up sending you to a completely different website than where you intended which could lead to an IP tracker or download for malicious software and then obviously as we know that could mess up your computer so VPNs are tools that can help protect against this. Atlas VPN will not only disguise your actual IP address which prevents your personal data from being exposed but it also has a feature that blocks malicious links so you won't have to click on them in the first place. Atlas VPN is supported on any and all devices, and all subscription purchases provide a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, they're currently running a special on their three-year deal where you can pay just $1.39 per month, so don't forget to check it out by clicking on the link in the description below. That is at atlasv.pn slash savvywritesbooks. That is linked both in my description below and in my pinned comment. Thank you again so much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring the video today. Let's get back into our topic. A few years ago, a movement called Own Voices, particularly a hashtag Own Voices movement on social media platforms, particularly Twitter, started to take off within the books industry. The idea behind Own Voices was that there's something special about a book that is told from the perspective of an author who actually is part of a certain identity that they're talking about. The example I like to give when I'm first explaining this to someone is that we've all seen those Twitter accounts that have men writing women on them and it's examples of how men write women characters and it'll be like the woman stared at her boobs in the mirror and her boobs were so boobishly large and then they boobishly bounced down the stairs hitting her in the face the entire time it's like when we see a lot of describing women in an overly sexualized way and a lot of people were like well maybe the solution to that is that we should uplift more books that are written by women doesn't mean that men can't write women at all although a lot of them do a shit job of it just means that maybe we should have more authors of different backgrounds. We see the same thing often with authors of different races saying, okay, why do we have so many books that are told by white authors when there are authors of various racial and ethnic backgrounds that have different family experiences, different cultural experiences, and have a deep understanding of the nuances of everything and can really bring that out in a story. I was a huge fan of the Own Voices movement when it first started. One of the books that came out around this time was Turtles All the Way Down by John Green and if you guys don't know, John Green is an author who has OCD. I have OCD and have talked about it a lot, and this was one of the first books I read that I felt captured what OCD truly feels like for me. There's little idiosyncrasies that a lot of stories, if they're trying to stereotype something or if they're trying to go from outside research, tend to get a little bit wrong. This book really captured it beautifully, and I loved that about it. We also saw the Own Voices movement taking stride in the LGBT community as well, with the idea that we have a lot of queer aspiring authors who want to write stories about young people struggling to come out or people who are coming of age or people who are entering a same gender relationship or going through a gender transition or something like that. Wouldn't it make sense if we could uplift stories by other queer authors who are telling these stories and can insert some of their own experiences or the emotions that have derived from their own experiences in there? Absolutely, I think it's a wonderful idea. The problem is that over time, the Own Voices movement morphed from the idea of it would be really great if we could prioritize these authors or uplift these authors into if you are not part of that marginalized identity and are writing that book, you are canceled. It took it from a positive effort to try to uplift people to what a lot of people were seeing as a requirement. And I've got to say, I probably blame social media for this because on social media, people are arguing about different things in the book community every single day. But let's take a look at a couple sources to talk about what the Own Voices movement was originally for. We're going to talk about the author Becky Albertalli and how she fit into this movement and who she is. And then we're going to talk about how this movement, while it was well-intentioned at first, eventually led to a massive trauma for her. So we've got this article right here called What is Own Voices? As readers and librarians, we are finding that the publishing world is making an effort to seek out more diverse perspectives and voices and to honor stories about characters from groups that have previously been marginalized. These groups include ethnic minorities, different sexual orientations and identities, and those with disabilities. The We Need Diverse Books movement has really sparked conversations and moved the ball forward. Own Voices is a hashtag movement started on Twitter 
used to recommend books about diverse characters that have been written by authors from that same diverse group. In 2015, young adult author Corinne Dubis posted on Twitter a suggestion that people use the Own Voices hashtag to recommend books. Originally, the conversation stemmed from her frustration as a bisexual disabled person that most emphasis was being placed on diverse books rather than diverse authors. She wanted to highlight authentic voices. So, as we can see, the Own Voices movement started with really, really awesome intentions. However, around the late 2010s, I'll say around 2019 and into 2020, the Own Voices Voices movement started to take a turn from the inclusive to the exclusive. It stopped being about let's prioritize these authors or let's do a big public splash and promote these authors on social media and give them some good publicity and instead turned into let's persecute an author who tries to write outside of their lane. Now as you guys can see this can become a problem pretty easily right because when a book comes out we don't always know everything about an author's personal life outside of what that author personally chooses to divulge. So if that author has a background or an identity that is different from what you are assuming about them based on limited knowledge of them, if they're a more private person or something like that, you can easily see how this could turn into a problem. According to the We Need Diverse Books website from June 6th of 2021, why We Need Diverse Books is no longer using the term hashtag own voices. We Need Diverse Books will no longer use the term own voices to refer to children's literature or its authors, and we have removed mentions of own voices from previously published blog posts. Moving forward, We Need Diverse Books will use specific descriptions that authors use for themselves and their characters whenever possible, for example, Korean American author or autistic protagonist. Own Voices was created as a hashtag by author Corinne Dubis in September 2015. It was originally intended as a shorthand book recommendation tool in a Twitter thread for readers to recommend books by authors who openly shared the diverse identity of their main characters. The hashtag was never intended to be used in broader capacity, but has it has since expanded in its use to become a catch-all marketing term used by the publishing industry. Using own voices in this capacity raises issues due to the vagueness of the term, which has been then been used to place diverse creators in uncomfortable and potentially unsafe situations. It is important to use the language that authors want to celebrate about themselves and their characters. And I'm going to be honest, I think this is long overdue. I have been a massive fan of the Own Voices movement since it began in 2015, but watching it turn into a way to try to determine which authors are allowed to write which stories has been scary for me. Because while I'm a very open person online, as an author, I don't actually divulge every single thing about my life. I have experiences that I've gone through, I have identities that I have for myself or am, have been questioning about myself and things like that for a long period of time that I don't necessarily want to talk about publicly. I have things that have happened in my past and my background that I don't want to talk about publicly because they involve other people and things like that. And that's not my responsibility to have to do that as an author. And I have always been scared that if I do ever choose to write about something that maybe someone doesn't know is part of my experience, that I will be pressured into having to talk about my own connection to it publicly, otherwise I will be considered problematic or my work will get cancelled in some way. I have been holding this fear inside for a long time and not quite sure how to talk about it on the internet. Unfortunately, in August of 2020, the exact situation that I'm terrified of happened to Becky Albertalli, which is what we're gonna talk about now. So let's start by talking about who is Becky Albertalli. If you guys are not here from the book side of my channel, if you're more into the business critique side and that kind of thing, maybe you haven't heard of Becky Albertalli before. She is a well-known and beloved young adult fiction author who first rose to prominence with her book Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, which was later adapted into the movie called Love, Simon. This book deals with the struggles of a gay teenager in his senior year of high school who is is not out to anyone in his life and is feeling lonely and isolated because of that in his town in Georgia. Eventually, over the course of the book, he ends up coming out privately on the internet. He meets a pen pal who also goes to his school and the two of them exchange emails. However, through various sets of teenage conflicts and teenage 
relationships and breakups and heartbreaks, Simon ends up in a situation where whether he's out or not is threatened to be revealed to the public without his consent. The story then delves into the implications of that and how Simon is able to come out to people on his own terms throughout the course of the book while trying to figure out the identity of his mysterious pen pal who is also not out to the school. I read it a couple years ago and then I saw the movie. The movie was okay. The book was definitely better. I feel like a lot of people are like the book is better and that's such a cliche thing to say. But anyway, I thought that the book was really good. There were some things about it I didn't like. If you guys remember me from my exclusively booktube days, there were some reviews I did of the book on my channel where I had some criticisms of it because I did think who Simon's pen pal was was a little bit obvious. Like, I guessed it pretty quickly and I was hoping that I was going to have a twist and it was going to be someone else, but I had guessed it correctly. And I thought the, the second half of the book kind of dragged a little bit, just a little things like that. Overall though, I thought the book was really good in terms of the diversity of different characters that was in the book. I think Becky Albertalli is fantastic at writing realistic teenage voices and dialogue and really bringing you into the story and bringing those characters to life on the page. I also then read her next book, Leah on the Offbeat, which takes place in that same universe. And this book had a similar theme. It's about a young girl named Leah, who is Simon's best friend in the first book. And she is also closeted. And nobody knew that in the first book, because the first book wasn't from her perspective. So she is a closeted bisexual woman who has been secretly in love with one of the women in their friend group this entire time and has not been public about that. So that book also deals with her coming out paralleled with the group's struggle of taking that next step of applying to college. It's really a coming of age story. And overall, again, I thought the writing was good. I did a review video of it on this channel. I actually gave it a negative review and it's because I thought that the book was boring, but overall I thought that the writing style was good and there's a clear theme throughout this. The reason I bring up the fact that I gave it a negative review is not to dunk on Becky because this video is as a whole to defend her in every possible way, but it's just to say that if you've gone through my channel and you knew me as someone who had critiqued her books in the past, that even though there are certain things about her books that I didn't like or that I would have wanted to see different, that doesn't mean that what happened to her in this case is in any way defensible. And I don't want people to be like, wow, Savvy, you're making this whole video to defend this author who you've critiqued in the past. Yeah, because we should be comfortable defending people we've critiqued. We should be comfortable critiquing people we like. The world is not black and white. And I think that black and white thinking is what led to a devastating situation like this happening. So anyway, Becky Albertalli has a common theme in her books of writing about teenagers discovering their sexual orientation or first being comfortable coming out to the people around them. The romances in these stories are often between people of the same gender, though they're not always. And overall, her books have resonated with a lot of young teenagers who have been going through similar things of questioning their own sexual orientation or trying to feel safe coming out to their own family and friends and things like that. So I have a lot of respect for her and the work that she does. The problem came when people took the Own Voices movement too far and attached it to Becky in a negative way. You guys can probably tell if you have any idea where this video is going. Becky Albertalli was not out. When Love, Simon and when Leah on the Offbeat came out, Becky's about the author page, all of her author bios and everything did not mention that she had any queer orientation at all. It mentioned that she had worked with children in the LGBT community and had tried to be a mentor to them. It never mentioned that she had any type of LGBT identity, however. So at that point, that's when the criticism started rolling in and we started seeing things like, why is this straight cis woman writing these LGBT books? Why is she the one who's getting famous? The truth is, Becky was not straight. Becky was in the closet. Hey, editing savvy here. So I'm working hard on editing this video and you won't believe that I found the most perfect thing. So while I was editing the section about how I felt bad that I'd given these books like less than stellar reviews, even though I liked uh, Love, Simon, I went back and looked at my book blog to see what I actually said in the reviews and look at this comment that someone left. So right here I have my review of Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda and then look at this comment right here from an anonymous commenter. And this is wild that I just saw this comment right here because nobody read my book blog. Like nobody paid any attention to me online before I started YouTube. And so the fact that I even had a comment at all is wild. But then this comment just like it's from 2018 and it illustrates the point of this video so perfectly. This person said, 
I felt bad that this was a straight woman writing the story. I think it came off as someone who can't really know what it's like to try to write a passable, normal gay character. He had no real external reason to fear coming out. Now, let me be clear about a few things. I think for this reader to say that they didn't think that Becky Albertalli did a good job conveying Simon's external motivation, totally valid criticism. But for them to say that Becky Albertalli was incapable of doing that because she was straight, when that's nothing that anyone but her can know, right? That's the problem here. And she was getting this criticism, basically, of it being like, well, the work is bad because you are straight, when actually she wasn't. And see, that was an example of one of those comments happening. But I just want to make it clear that, like, criticizing her work, regardless of sexual orientation, if you want to say, I didn't see Simon's external motivation clearly illustrated in the story, valid critique, someone else might have felt differently, but a valid criticism, versus if you want to say, Becky is straight and therefore Simon can like then you're attacking the person instead of the work I hope that distinction makes sense but I thought that comment illustrated it really well and I just found it right now I think a lot of people forget that just because you're a public figure doesn't mean everything about you has to be out in the open especially if you're an author who's someone who would normally let your work speak for itself and not have to put yourself out there as the product as much as your work so as all this criticism was rolling in in order to save the integrity of her books and to save her own career Becky decided to come out on August 31st, 2020, in an article that she posted on Medium. We're gonna go through this post that she put up on Medium right now, and honestly, after reading this, and after knowing what happened, and after seeing the fallout that happened after this, because you would think that after this happened, everyone would have been like, oh shit, I'm sorry, but some people doubled down. Book Twitter's a mess. Anyway, after seeing all of that, the title is just devastating. I know I'm late. In, as the title of her coming out letter, as if, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you this sooner. As if she's to say, I owed you this information. It, that's just, that's just devastating. That's so sad that she, she felt that way. Every so often, a tweet or meme will go around asking people to respond with all the screamingly queer things they did before they knew they were queer. Stuff like being obsessed with the Indigo Girls, writing gay fan fiction, or volunteering with queer kids for 10 years. Oh, here's mine. Um, when I was a kid, I had this journal. Uh, it had Barbie on the front, and in it I used to write the names of cute girls in my class and hearts in it. It's pretty obvious, but that was my gay ass as a child. When I was learning to type, this was like right after the movie Spy Kids came out and I would practice my typing by just typing Alexa Vega is the most beautiful woman in the world over and over again. Wasn't obvious or anything. I came out at age 24 and I also apologized for taking so long on it. Or how about this one? Writing a book about a closeted gay kid in Georgia who doesn't want to come out because he doesn't want people to make his sexuality a big deal and then right after the release of the film adaptation publishing a number one New York Times bestseller sequel about what else a closeted bisexual girl. My debut YA book, Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, came out that April and I knew nothing about book promotion. But I figured out one thing pretty quickly. When you're a brand new author, the first thing interviews want to know about is your inspiration. I hated that question. Mostly because I never had a good answer when it came to Simon. I talk about how the book was based on my high school, or how I reread all of my teen journals before I wrote the first draft, or I just list all the ways Simon and I are alike there was always one particular follow-up question I dreaded. Why is Simon gay? Why did you, a cishet woman, write a book about a gay teen boy? I think it's a little weird that people are asking, like, in interviews, like, oh, your main character's gay? Are you gay? Like, that's a weird question to ask people. I think you, people need to go into these situations with the understanding that if someone is not out publicly, probably, you're probably not going to be the interviewer who they're going to come out to before everyone else. Like, that that's just a, that's a little ridiculous. But then it was 2018 and a couple things happened. First, Love, Simon came out in March, which was one of the most electrifying, unforgettable, truly extraordinary experiences of my life. But having your book adapted to a film brings a lot of notoriety and attention, especially online, and it's not always the fun kind. Unsurprisingly, there was quite a bit of discourse about my identity. How could there not be? Love, Simon was the first gay teen rom-com to be widely adapted by a major film studio, and it was based on a book written by an allo cishet woman. Yes, the film's director was openly gay. No, not everyone cared. Frankly, a lot of people still don't know Love, Simon was based on a book. But in many online spaces, my straightness was a springboard for some legitimately important conversations about representation, authenticity, and ownership of stories. And for some people, my 
straightness was enough to boycott the film entirely. Then, Leah on the Offbeat came out about a month later, and the discourse exploded all over again. There were think pieces based on the premise that I, a straight woman, clearly knew nothing about being a bi girl. There were tweets and threads and blog posts, and just about every single one I came across mentioned my straightness. And when Leah debuted on the New York Times list, authors I admired and respected tweeted their disappointment. To me, it felt like there was never a break in the discourse, and it was often searingly personal. I was frequently mentioned by name, held up again and again as the quintessential example of Allo cishet inauthenticity. I was a straight woman writing shitty queer books for the straights, profiting off communities I had no connection to. Because the thing is, I called myself straight in a bunch of early interviews. But labels change sometimes. That's what everyone always says, right? It's okay if you're not out. It's okay if you're not ready. It's okay if you don't fully understand your identity yet. There's no time limit, no age limit, no one right way to be queer. And yet a whole lot of these very same people seem to know with absolute certainty that I was allo cishet. And the less certain I was, the more em emphatically strangers felt the need to declare it. Apparently, it was obvious from my writing. Simon's fine, but it was clearly written by a het. You can just tell her books aren't really for queer people. I have defended over and over on this channel the right of reviewers to say whatever the fuck they want. Reviewers can insult anything about an author's work. However, I have always made it clear that I think it is okay for reviewers to insult an author's work and not an author as a person. If you want to read Love, Simon, or you want to read Leah on the Offbeat, if you read these books and think that the queer representation is shit, that's fine. If you have a reason that you didn't like the way that a gay or a bisexual character was portrayed in these books, you have every right to tell the internet that and Becky would be an asshole if she came after you for it. However, you do not have the right to say, Becky is obviously straight because of this. Because no one has the right to tell someone else what their sexual orientation is. Does that make sense? I will say I did a video on this channel called Worst to Best Books for Bisexual Representation. And in that video, I actually put Leah on the offbeat as one of the ones in the not as good categories. Because I didn't think that the, the story, I didn't think that the story did that good of a job in it. I didn't. And that has nothing to do with Becky's identity because Becky's identity is only her business. I actually put multiple books that were written by bisexual authors, I didn't give them that good of a rating. Not because the author didn't tell their own experience well, but because I was the one reviewing the book and it didn't resonate with me. Let me be perfectly clear. This isn't how I wanted to come out. This doesn't feel good or empowering or even particularly safe. Honestly, I'm doing this because I've been scrutinized, subtweeted, mocked, lectured, and invalidated just about every single day for years, and I'm exhausted. And if you think I'm the only closeted or semi-closeted queer author feeling this pressure, you haven't been paying attention. This was a tweet that I saw that I think really captured what happened really beautifully, and it came out, this tweet came out in September of 2020, only a couple days after the book had come out, and this was tweeted by L.W. Wrights, who's an author named Lou. I actually have one of her books right now that I have been meaning to read. So uh, shout out to her, follow Lou on Twitter. I'm so angry that the person who wrote, I'm supposed to decide when and where and who knows and how I want to say it was bullied into coming out by the very people she was writing for. So that was a quote from the book Love, Simon was where Simon was talking about how his be his own choice, that he shouldn't be pressured into doing it by other people. And a lot of people resonated with that. Yet the same thing then happened to Becky because Becky felt pressured into coming out when she didn't want to. And I think that's something we have to remember. We can say that an author is straight, but we shouldn't criticize an author for being straight because an author may just be saying that they're straight for their own safety. They may not be in a position where they're comfortable coming out yet. So if you know an author who identifies as straight and they're writing about a gay character, I think it's important that we look at how they wrote the character and how they told the story as opposed to is this person really a part of this identity? I'll give another example. Rainbow Rowell identifies as a straight woman publicly. Is she maybe not a straight woman? Who knows? Who knows? I don't know what's going on inside her head and I won't claim to know that she's straight or not straight or whatever. But that's what she identifies as publicly and that's what we should respect. 
I have criticized her books for representation as well because she refuses to acknowledge bisexuality as a concept. In in Carry On and Wayward Son, I'm still reading Anyway the Wind Blows, so I have I'm not gonna review that one yet. So don't don't get mad at me because I might be wrong about that book. Don't give me any spoilers in the comments. I'm just saying that's an example of an author I was mad at for that in the past and had talked about that. But it's important to, if you're gonna be mad at someone like her about that, to be mad at that author because you thought what was in the text itself was not good, as opposed to that the author themselves has the wrong identity, because you never know. Even when we look at the idea of men writing women and things like that, are men writing women with sexist depictions? If so, criticize that. Also criticize women who write other women with sexist depictions because I see a hell of a lot of slut shaming in romance written by women. Now, one might think, one might think, if Twitter weren't such a hell world, if we lived in a better society where Twitter didn't, do, didn't cover book discourse the way that it does, one might think that people would have read this letter from Becky and been like, damn, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry, Becky. Like, dude, I, girl, I'm gonna start apologizing. I am sorry, Becky. And a lot of people did. A lot of people said, you know what? This was wrong. This was terrible that this happened to her. And it's even caused me to reflect. It's important to take a step back and be like, hmm, how have we been interpreting certain works of literature? It's caused me to take a pause and be like, did I, did I think that maybe my bias of not knowing that Becky was queer herself because she wasn't out about it, did that color my reading of the book at all? Because I read these books years ago, before, long before she wrote this. Should I read them again and see if that changes anything? Will I be more biased now? I don't know. But I think it's important to reflect on those things. And a lot of people have been, and I think that's good. But some people have doubled down. Some people have come at this from the angle that, you ready to feel my soul leave my body? Some people have come at this from the perspective that Becky is straight passing. Someone get me a bucket to vomit in. You know what? I'm just going to drink coffee. I'll, I'll swallow the vomit with coffee. Here we go. I'll link the bisexual commentary playlist up in the cards if you need me to tell you why straight passing privilege does not exist. It doesn't exist. Straight passing privilege is not real. To say straight passing privilege is real is the same thing to say that closeted privilege is real. Is closeted privilege real? No, because being closeted is a result of discrimination. Okay? Why else would people need to be closeted other than society is homophobic? Do we get it? Do, do, do we feel things better now? Is that understandable? Uh, more detailed nuanced commentary up in the cards. Have fun. Okay, Book Talk, there's some stuff happening over on Book Twitter that I don't think enough of us over here are talking about yet. So about a week ago, a burner account appeared on Twitter, zero followers, zero following, um, and it is called Cold Brew Coffee, spelled like this, and they just post a lot of really vile, transphobic, and biphobic things. Now, a lot of people on Twitter have connected this account to a YA author whose debut comes out next year, whose social media accounts disappeared around the same time this burner account appeared. We didn't see part one. There was a burner account that appeared on Twitter that was attacking some bi and trans authors. Uh, there were some people on Twitter connecting it to actually an author with an upcoming debut in 2022, uh, but I didn't have proof, so I didn't make that connection. But now I've gone back and I've actually seen some screenshots of that author's Twitter that is now deleted, and there's just as much awful stuff on that as well. So the author's name is Milani Moreno. I'm gonna post some screenshots of his Twitter right here.
so let's talk for a second about the negative reviews that this book got. So this guy, Malani Moreno, who was tweeting about this, had a book coming out called An Island Without You. Do I think that Malani Moreno is a disgusting person for the way that he treated Becky Albertalli and the way that he discussed the bisexual demographic and the way that he basically threw trans and non-binary people under the bus as saying that they're just a cisgender people in denial. Basically, the way that he tried to erase bisexual and transgender people from the ability to write queer characters, that's disgusting. I think that he's a nasty person for that, and I probably wouldn't want to buy his book and support him. It's not even been an hour since I posted that, but I just saw on my friend Carter's Instagram that that book is no longer being published, and I will post the screenshot right here. So now let's look at the big picture of this situation as a whole. I want to posit the following question to you. Who is to blame? So we had a situation where an author was pressured out of the closet. She wasn't pressured by homophobic people. She was pressured by people from within the LGBT demographic itself. She was pressured by queer readers. We have this other author, Maulani Moreno, whose book was pulled from publication because of the way that he was behaving on Twitter, being such an asshole to her about this. We could also say that his actions are coming from a place of hurt for not seeing a lot of what he wants to see represented in literature, or maybe because he is getting not as big of publication deals or things like that, which could could come from a place of hurt. Not that it would ever justify that behavior. Nothing would justify that behavior, but maybe that's where it originally stems from. Maybe the reason that a lot of people were critical of Becky was that they were worried that people weren't getting those big publication deals or they were worried that an industry that had previously been dominated by straight people because straight people are the majority that that trend was going to continue if someone didn't say something. Who is the villain here? I know the answer. I want to know what you guys think it is. Because the truth is, I don't want to say that anyone was coming at this from place despite how awful the situation turned out. The villain here will not come as a surprise to you if you've watched my channel for any length of time. In my opinion, this is the fault of corporations. The corporatization of the publishing industry is a massive problem for the way that books are distributed and authors are treated. Now let me draw this connection real quick because if some people are like, Savvy, you're gonna blame corporations, you're gonna blame corporations because individual people were being assholes. Again, nothing absolves the people who put that pressure on Becky. Nothing absolves Malulani Moreno for his behavior of treating bisexual and transgender people the way that he did on Twitter. That was disgusting disgusting. That was nasty of him to do. But on this channel, we're all about finding root causes. We're about looking at a situation and saying, why did this happen? I don't like that this happened, but why did it happen? We can say something happened because someone's an asshole, because someone's an evil person, but that's never the only reason. Things always come from more complicated places than that. So why did this happen? Why did people pressure Becky into coming out? Why did people want to say that people should write in their lane? Why do people only want certain stories that are written by authors of that identity as well. Because all day you can say, yes, I want stories that are written by people of this identity because I think they do a better job. Well, that's great, but the existence of books that are written where the author is not that identity don't make those books exist any less where they are written by the author that's of that identity. There's no limit on the number of books that can exist in the world. Infinite books can exist. So where does the problem come from? It comes from Five corporations dominating the publishing industry. Authors should not have to compete this ruthlessly to the point where people are saying, let's try to scrutinize which authors are really gay or really trans or really queer or really part of this identity, really disabled, really mentally ill. Let's, let's try to scrutinize that. Let's try to vet that as readers from the outside. The only reason people would be thinking that is because there are a limited number of large book advances that go out every year. And there is no across the board wealth distribution of this. There are five publishing industries that dominate the market. The majority of book publishing companies are imprints 
of those five companies. And if you get to legitimately small presses, you can still get your book out through those. But people are worried that the big deals are going to all be taken up by people in majority groups instead of the marginalized identities that they're supposedly profiting from. The solution here is to dissolve the big five publishing companies and support small presses. A small press, small presses have been representing queer authors and queer literature from the beginning. Independent authors got queer romance up and running as a thing from the beginning. Queer romance is one of the biggest categories you can buy of independently published books, of books that authors put out themselves without any publisher or distributor. If we recognize that small presses are putting out often even better quality books than big presses are, and that self-published authors are equally as legitimate, and that self-publishing books is a way to get your voice out there, then we can accept the notion that there is no limit to the number of books in the world. And once we accept that there's no limit to the number of books that can exist in the world, we can realize that anyone can write any story and then it's up to readers to discern based on the story's quality. So, okay, this person who's supposedly straight wrote a gay romance. There's also a bunch of gay people writing gay romances. If I want to read a gay romance by an out gay person, I have that option, but I don't have to criticize this other person for doing it because infinite books can exist. And it, in this ideal world, it wouldn't matter who is the one getting which publication deal because the industry shouldn't be so heavily dominated by five companies that there's that much competition up at the top to put books in the world. That's where the real problem is coming from. So here's my solutions for you guys. Buy books from small presses. Buy books from small bookstores owned by women, owned by queer women. And if you don't know if someone is queer, if you don't know if someone is gay or trans or bi or whatever, if you don't know, don't assume. And if you see a book and you're like, this book is written by an author that's not of that identity, don't assume that. Oh, this book has disability representation in it, but the author is clearly not disabled. How the fuck do you know? How do you know what's happened in their life? Oh, this book is about mental illness, but the author themselves is not mentally ill. How do you know? You don't know these things. Stop demanding information about authors' personal lives and judge the work on the quality of the work. I am saddened that this situation happened to Becky Albertalli. I think that she seems like a really great person. I think she's a really good writer. Even if I have had criticisms of her books, I still think her writing is good and has had an overall positive impact on queer representation in literature for teenagers. If you want to know more of my opinions on cancel culture, read my book Cancel Sean Boston. It just came out a week ago. Wow, that went by fast. Do you think the Own Voices movement has been corrupted by the oversimplicity of Twitter discourse? But I just do want to put this forth as an example of bisexual erasure being dangerous. Because when I've put out videos in the past talking about straight passing privilege not being real, people will be like, well, bisexual erasure is annoying, but it's not really dangerous. No, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And I've given plenty of examples of public health issues that are reasons that it's dangerous. But it's also dangerous because when we place this assumption, when we judge someone by the relationship that they're in, situations like this end up happening where someone is criticized until they're forced out of the closet. And that is not the way that we want to treat the LGBT community when we should be supporting each other and trying to keep each other safe in this world. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. I will see you guys again on Monday. Keep on supporting small businesses, support small presses, buy from self-published authors, buy from small bookstores, buy from people selling chat books at open mic poetry nights in your neighborhood, buy from people at art festivals who bound books themselves, go on Etsy and buy a bound planner that someone designed on their own Etsy shop. Buy something that someone printed at a local print shop. Don't rely on big publishers and big corporations to tell you what books are the only ones that are worthwhile or to create this false sense of scarcity in the world of books and story sharing because that's a tragedy. I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye friends. Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. <laughs>